Today, the Royal Navy uses ads that stress individual achievement, career development, great pay, and adventure. What young man or woman looking for adventure could resist such an attractive offer? However, in times gone by, the Royal Navy used a more direct method to get men to enlist. Until the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain relied upon the press to fill their manpower shortage to man their ships. As Lord Nelson said, without a press, I have no idea how our fleet can be manned. So what is the press? Well, it was formerly referred to as impressment. It was the involuntary service in the Royal Navy by the way of a press gang. Impressment had been used to man the English Navy since the Tudor period under the rule of Queen Victoria I. It would become law under statute and eventually the Vagrancy Act of 1597 would allow the press gang to impress homeless and undesirable men into naval service. The only other choice these men had were penal servitude in the new colonies or the death sentence. The men really didn't have any choice in the matter. The Navy needed men, so they were not particular about who they would grab. Now, especially when the press gangs were paid for each man they delivered. On land, the press gangs were made up of naval officers and usually local toughs who would rather be part of the press gang than part of the impressed. By 1703, the Parliament passed an act that put limits on who could be impressed. Now, the press gang had to follow a prescribed set of rules, which were sometimes ignored in the heat of the moment, such as a hot press. What's that? Well, at the height of Royal Naval Impressment, any male between the ages of 18 and 55 could be impressed. The only males exempt from the press gang were skilled shipyard workers, apprentices, foreigners, and non-seamen, as long as they had a valid certificate of exemption. However, when the Admiralty ordered a hot press because shortages in the fleet, basically no one was exempt, not even the guys with certificate. Sorry for your luck, buddy. We need you. Now, at sea, a captain of the Royal Naval ship had the right to stop any British merchant ship and impress any crew the captain deemed suitable for naval service. The captain of the merchant ship would try to hide their best experienced men from the press, but in most cases it was a futile gesture. The impressment in the Royal Navy reached its zenith during the Napoleonic Wars. It is estimated that almost half of the seamen in the Royal Navy at that time were impressed into service. It was the Royal Navy's need for men that would be one of the causes of the War of 1812. Now, during the Napoleonic Wars, America was a new sovereign nation. The country did not have a large navy. The reestablishment of the U.S. Navy did not become a reality until 1797 due to the Barbary Corsairs capturing American merchant ships and enslaving their crews. Now, to combat this piracy, Congress authorized completion of three frigates out of the original six frigates it had authorized in March of 1794, but canceled before completion. All three frigates were commissioned in 1797. The United States was launched on May 10, 1797, the Constellation on September 7, 1797, and the Constitution on October 21, 1797. However, compared to the Royal Navy at this time, the U.S. fleet was insignificant. For seamen, it was due to a high desertion rate. Now, at that time, British seamen composed 35% to 40% of U.S. naval crews. See, British sailors were enticed to serve in the U.S. Navy and in the merchant fleet because of better pay and working conditions. The British Admiralty was going to get their men back one way or another. British law at that time stated, a British subject did not give up his citizenship simply because becoming a naturalized citizen of another country. The British government claimed the right to stop any foreign merchant ship and look for British deserters. They claimed the right to enter American ports and arrest, and arrest British deserters. In rare cases, British warships would enter American ports and send out press gangs looking for deserters. In most cases, a British man of war would lie in wait outside of an American harbor and simply stop American merchantmen and demand to come on board to look for their Royal Naval deserters or any man they suspected of being a British subject by birth. Now, a man claiming to be a naturalized American was not recognized by the British government. At that time, it was difficult for a person to prove they were born in America. Birth certificates weren't a commonly issued item back then. Now, these men were forcibly taken off their ship and impressed into the Royal Navy. 
The U.S. government would formally protest, but with no Navy to speak of, there was little the government could do to get these men back. Now, between 1803 and the outbreak of the War of 1812, it is estimated that at least 10,000 American seamen were impressed into the Royal Navy. The most notorious impressment incident happened in 1807 when the USS Chesapeake was forcibly stopped on the high seas by the HMS Leopard. It is known as the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. The British and French were at war, but America was neutral, and we were trading with both sides. We didn't want to get involved. Now, the British had a North American naval squadron based out of Halifax, Nova Scotia, which they would use to blockade American harbors, keeping French merchant ships and warships from entering or leaving. Now, when the opportunity would present itself, British seamen and American seamen who had been impressed into His Majesty's service took the opportunity to jump ship and to escape to American soil in freedom. These deserters were given protection from the British by the local authorities. The problem was, these men would then sign on to an American merchant ship or enlist in the U.S. Navy in the mistaken belief that they would be protected by virtue of serving on board an American vessel. British agents were in all the ports and they would report on French ships in the harbor and also about suspected British seamen who had deserted and what ships they had signed on to. The Mutiny of Jenkin Radford. Now, this is taken from the trial transcripts. HMS Halifax, an 18-gun sloop in the North British North American Squadron, was anchored in Hampton Roads, blockading the French warships, which had taken refuge in Chesapeake Bay. On Saturday, March 7, 1807, about 6 p.m., First Lieutenant Thomas Warren Carter sent the jolly boat, that's a small ship's boat, with Mr. Robert Turner, a midshipman, and five men, Robert Herbert, Henry Saunders, Jenkin Radford, George North, and William Hill, to weigh a keg anchor, which had been dropped to swing the ship around. They got hold of the uh, hawser and had raised the anchor up to the bow. When it came on to rain very hard, the weather being thick, the men took advantage of the occasion to row the boat as quickly as possible towards Sewell's Point. Turner hailed the ship repeatedly until silenced by Hill threatening to knock his brains out and throw him overboard. Volleys of musketry were shot off at them from the Halifax and some large guns were, were got ready. But unfortunately the jolly boat had by this time gotten so far in the dust that it was useless to fire. Moreover, a tender from the sister ship, Bologna, was immediately in her wake so that to fire would be dangerous. On reaching Sewell's Point, all five men jumped out and left Turner and the midshipmen in the jolly boat. Now the captain of Halifax was not happy. And the next day, two of the deserters were seen in Norfolk, Virginia. Lord James Townsend, the captain of the Halifax, went to Norfolk to enlist the help of the British Council in retrieving his deserters. It was then found that the, der the deserters had joined the USS Chesapeake 38-gun uh, three-masted heavy frigate. Captain Townsend officially requested that the British deserters be turned over to him. Lieutenant Sinclair, basically the mustering officer of the Chesapeake, denied any knowledge of British deserters signing on a ship's crew. Now, interestingly, Townsend met with two of the deserters later, Saunders and Radford. He asked them why they did not return to the ship. Radford told Townsend that he was in the land of liberty and had no intention of giving up his freedom. That's going to come back and haunt him later. Now, desertions became a common practice among the seamen of the North Atlantic Squadron. The ships were so close to shore, it was the best chance an impressed seaman had to regain his freedom or to escape the harsh discipline of the Royal Navy. Now, this last group of deserters and the lack of cooperation from the American authorities in turning over British naval deserters brought the issue to a head. Admiral George Cranfeld Berkeley, commander of the North American Squadron, decided he was going to put an end to the desertions and teach the uncooperative Americans a lesson. He issued an order to his command. On June 1, 1807, he ordered the captains and commanders of his fleet to stop the USS Chesapeake and, showing this order, search her for desertions, permitting the American commander to search their ship for deserters if desired. So nice of them. Now, the USS Chesapeake was being refitted and crewed in preparation for a cruise to the Mediterranean 
where she would relieve the USS Constitution, which had been on station since 1803, providing protection against the Barbary pirates. The ship's commanding officer was Master Commandant Charles Gordon. It was his responsibility to ensure the Chesapeake was ready for sea duty. Commander James Barron was on board as the newly appointed Commodore of the Mediterranean Squadron. So even though Charles was the captain of the Chesapeake, Barron was responsible for the Chesapeake in any naval engagement. Both officers failed in their duty to make sure the Chesapeake was ready for sea and action. Now in the court martial proceedings against Barron, the court stated that Barron visited the Chesapeake only twice during the period she remained in Hampton Roads and before he came on board to proceed to sea. On neither of which occasions did he examine particularly into her state and condition. He also had no idea that the British demanded the return of Radford Jenkins, who was now part of the Chesapeake's crew. Commandant Gordon falsely reported that the Chesapeake was ready for sea on June 19, 1807, when in reality she was not. Chesapeake was completely unprepared to defend herself. None of her guns were primed for operation, and the spar deck, that's a deck formed by spare spars that are roped together to provide a temporary service, known as the spar deck, was filled with material that were not properly stowed in the cargo hold. Her guns were not stowed correctly, her shots were not correctly sized. On June 22, 1807, the Chesapeake set sail from Norfolk Harbor for the Mediterranean. As the Chesapeake passed, the British squadron anchored in Lynn Haven Bay, signals were exchanged furiously between the British warships. HMS Leopold, Le Leopard, I'm sorry, got underway to overtake the Chesapeake and retrieve the four deserters. By 3 p.m., the Leopard had closed in on the Chesapeake. When the Leopard was within hailing distance, Captain S Salisbury Price Humphreys, cool name, claimed he had dispatched he had dispatches for the Chesapeake and asked permission to send over a boat. At this time, the Leopard had her guns ready for action. Now, British Lieutenant Meade boarded the Chesapeake and presented Commander Barron with Admiral Berkeley's orders. Barron immediately refused the request. Lieutenant Meade returned to the Leopard and informed Captain Humphreys of Barron's response. Realizing the danger of the situation, Barron ordered his ship to clear for action. However, before any of the guns could be loaded, Captain Humphreys, who already had the Leopard's guns run out and ready to fire, opened fire on the Chesapeake. For the next 10 minutes, the Leopard fired broadsides into the Chesapeake. Now, realizing he was outgunned, his hull had taken at least 20 shots, his mass and rigging were mangled beyond use, and he had four dead and 16 wounded, Baron being one of them. He struck the colors of the Chesapeake. He surrendered his ship with only one shot fired in her defense. Captain Humphreys refused the surrender and sent a boarding party to Chesapeake to search for the deserters. The newspaper, Virginia Argus, reported on June 27, 1807, what happened when the British contingent boarded the Chesapeake. The colors now being down, an officer was dispatched to the Chesapeake who, on coming aboard, expressed some regret on behalf of his commander for what had happened. He was received with great indignation by the American officers, who tendered their swords, which he refused, saying that he wanted the four men and nothing more, and demanded the muster roll. Then the degrading spectacle of nearly 400 Americans mustered on the deck of an American man of war by order of a British lieutenant and four men taken away. Captain Humphreys refused to take the Chesapeake as a prize. Instead, he offered assistance to Commodore Barron. Barron declined the offer and limped back into Hampton Roads. Yeah, sorry I blew your ship up, mate. Now let me help you fix it. Yeah. Now, upon his return to Hampton Roads, the people of Hampton, Virginia became incensed over the attack and went on a rampage, and they destroyed 200 hogsheads of water which were loaded on a schooner awaiting shipment out to the British Man of War, Melampus. The outrage over the firing on and boarding of the Chesapeake, Chesapeake spread throughout the country. There were calls for all-out war in Britain. America had to avenge the gross insult to its national sovereignty. President Jefferson's State Department made a formal request for the return of the four seamen, but nothing happened. 
So, what happened to the four men taken off to Chesapeake? Of the four men, Daniel Martin, John Strachan, and William Ware, and Jenkin Radford, only Radford was British born. The others were American citizens. Jenkin Radford and the others were taken directly to the HMS Bellafleet in Halifax Harbor, Nova Scotia for court martial. Radford trial lasted one day. On Wednesday, August 26, 1807, Radford was found guilty of desertion, mutinous, and contemptuous behavior towards his officers. The court sentenced Radford to the ultimate punishment, death by hanging. In delivering its verdict, the court stated, The offenses of which you have been found guilty are of so flagrant a nature that I cannot flatter you with the least hope of a pardon. I therefore earnestly recommend your employing the shortest time you may have to live in making your peace with heaven. All who are now present and have witnessed this trial, as well as the crews of others of His Majesty's ship, must be convinced of the heinous crime of desertion, more particularly of when it is attended with mutinous and contemptuous behavior to your officers. The phrase came back and haunted him. The fate of the unfortunate prisoner will, I trust, sink deep into your minds and prevent continuous of an offense hurtful to your country and disgraceful to the character of the British seaman. That following Monday at 9.15 a.m. on board the HMS Halifax, Jenkin Radford, a.k.a. John Wilson, age 42, was brought to the fore yard arm. His hands and feet were bound. A noose was placed around his neck. The other end of the line was threaded through a pulley hanging from the yard arm. His shipmates were given the order. They slowly hauled on the line until Jenkins' body was hanging right below the yard arm. The entire crew was made to watch as a deterrent against mutiny. Daniel Martin, John Strachan, and William Ware were tried by court-martial, found guilty of desertion from the HMS Melampus, and sentenced to 500 lashes. However, the sentences were later reduced, the men were pardoned, and two of the three men returned to the United States a month after the War of 1812 broke out. One of the sailors did die in captivity. Now, the court martial of James Barron lasted 30 days. When given a chance to speak to the court, Barron submitted a long statement read by his lawyer, refuting the charges and specifications. He concluded his statement, but a few words more to add. My destiny is in your hands, my life, my honor, the sole patrimony to which 10 years of service enable me to bestow on my posterity. Hang on your decision. I await that decision with the solid, solicitous which those great considerations ought to inspire. The one blessing I can never be deprived, a mind free from self-reproach and unconscious of offense against the duties of my state or the honor of my country. Commander Barron was found guilty of dereliction of duty and suspended from active duty for five years. Captain Charles Gordon, the captain of the Chesapeake, was found guilty of dereliction of duty and given a private letter of reprimand. Now, Captain John Hall, United States Marine Corps commander of the Marine unit on board the Chesapeake, he was tried and found guilty of dereliction of duty. He was also given a private letter of reprimand. Admiral Berkeley was recalled by the British government and reprimanded for his actions. However, he became a hero to the British people. To avoid another incident, that December, President Jefferson pushed through Congress the Embargo Act of 1807. Now, this act was a general trade embargo on all foreign nations, as well as keeping American merchant ships in port. Thereby, American merchant sailors could not be impressed. The act, the act backfired. America's economy was not strong enough to place economic sanctions on foreign nations. The act was repealed in 1809, but the damage had been done to American trade and prestige abroad. The British continued with their policy of impressment of American seamen until the U.S. declared war on Great Britain on June 18, 1812. This is our history. This is our heritage. I hope you found this video interesting. Now, if you did, click the like button, subscribe to my channel, and uh, ring the bell. Most importantly, leave a comment below. I post a new video about every two weeks. Thank you for taking the time to watch.